founder and CTO of AgriFi. And uh, I'm here again with uh, David Kessler, our VP of Horticulture and Customer Success. And today's special guest, another Matt, I must say, uh, very excited about that, is Matthew Norgren with uh, Arcadian. Um, and uh, I understand, uh, Matt, that uh, you're a leading venture capitalist in the cannabis space. So you should have your uh, finger on the pulse of what's happening in cannabis and what the future holds. So we're very excited to learn all about that. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Matt. David, good to be with you guys. It's been too long since we've been able to be in person, but virtual community will do for now. Yes, I think we Thank last so saw each other on. at um, uh, uh, Boston at a trade show there, I believe. Yes, that's correct. That was a good time. You guys had a uh, phenomenal showing then, by the way. The, the booth is uh, very attractive, so can't wait to be at it again in person. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to trade shows happening again. It's, it's such a great way to network with people, which I think is essential to the growth of any industry. So, uh, so David, um, you know, you were uh, just informing me uh, that there's some exciting news in the cannabis space. Uh, can you tell us about that? Oh, sure, there's always David. exciting news because Oh, no. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Hello? yes. All right. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. With a nascent industry as volatile as the markets have been, there's a lot of happenings on a day to day basis. But the one that I was most excited to see today was that Maine, the state of Maine, has relaxed their residency requirements, meaning that non residents can apply to open cannabis businesses in the state, making it much more open to investments from larger companies, as well as giving a larger swath of, of people an opportunity to enter the cannabis space. And so markets like Colorado and Oregon had already made that kind of change, but it really changes the playing field and makes it more level, allowing more entrance into the space and uh, hopefully allowing the most qualified to rise to the top and succeed. But it's nice to see that those regulations are changing uh, because it does provide that opportunity. Matthew, are you seeing any regulatory changes that are exciting from a VC perspective? Well, quite a few. Glad you asked. And Matt, uh, thanks for uh, you know int the introduction earlier. But I'll tell you, uh, we're only as good as our partners. Um, and uh, we're fortunate to be a partner of AgriFi, an investor in AgriFi. And, uh, you know, uh, regulatory changes we'll get to in just a sec. But I think it's important to point out that uh, we couldn't be more encouraged with the companies we're involved with. And we have about 35 in our portfolio. But uh, these companies and these founders are just battle tested. And uh, it's been a lot of fun over these last few months working through, uh, you know, some, some difficult challenges, some not so difficult challenges, all the pivoting that's going on. So, um, you know, it's been a lot of fun working with you guys and everybody else. And thank you for uh, being who you are uh, and, and letting us be a part of that journey. From a regulatory standpoint, you know, we're seeing a lot. We're seeing a lot. But I think what we're more excited about is what's to come. And uh, when you look at the fact that this industry has been deemed essential uh, and all the conversations that we have on a daily basis, you can't imagine how excited different folks are to go have a conversation with that tool in their belt. Um, whether you're a lobbyist, a politician, a business person, uh, it, it changes that narrative and um, people need to get back to having that. Uh, so I think the regulatory changes that are ahead of us are very exciting. I mean, guys, it reminds me, if you go back and study that 1917 to 1933 period where you had these years of uh, alcohol prohibition working towards an end, uh, you have a very eerie, eerily similar situation in terms of pandemics. Uh, then you had a war, you had a recession, and uh, there was a lot of reasons why alcohol had a lot of support from the people, had great tax revenue, had uh, job creation, things that this industry do at a significant level that if you're on the regulatory side, you're sitting at city, state, and federal levels right now trying to put things back together. 
and all you have to do is allow a few things to happen for this industry and all that starts to take place. So, you know, from regulatory standpoint, um, we love the fact that uh, some things were just proposed to be included in the new COVID-19 bill federally, which is massive. And this was yesterday and the day before. So we have to see if it gets through Senate, that will change everything from a banking standpoint. Um, and for us, that's probably the biggest regulatory thing to pay attention to, because to imagine that you can be a $16.5 billion revenue generating industry in 2019, up 36% from the year before, by the way, at macro level, and we're growing at what, 33% every year. So when you put all that together and you walk into this pandemic, I, I think you have to be pretty excited about the fact that we can contribute to what the world's facing today in a major way. So a long answer, but I think the regulatory happenings right now are fantastic for our industry. But going forward, that's what we really have to pay attention to. And I think a lot of the things we've all been working very hard to do are going to happen potentially sooner than we had ever thought before because of this. Well, I think that there's been a number of discussion points uh, since the uh, COVID-19 pandemic started about how this is accelerating changes that were already happening in the market. Um, and it sounds like you're sort of echoing that, that in cannabis, some of the things that uh, you were seeing are being accelerated by the situation. It, it really is. Um, and, you know, the dialogue that has to happen to get people back to where they want to be, this new normal, we don't know what it is. Um, it's interesting when you think about cannabis and hemp because you have an industry, and, and, and Matt, David, you could check me if I'm wrong on this, but I don't know another industry that can say these three things. And this is how we think a lot right now about the industry. We always look at what was life like before the pandemic? What has life been like during and what is it going to be like? Well, as mentioned a second ago, we grew 36% as an industry last year. And people look at public market valuation corrections, or they look at uh, some headline news. But the reality is, that's a pretty strong number. Not many industries did that, while at the same time creating tremendous asset value along, along the way. Uh, so it's an industry you can underwrite. It's an exciting industry to underwrite from a debt and credit perspective. Also, going into the pandemic, you look at what happened in the markets last year in general, not for cannabis and hemp. And you look at the fact that 23% of companies that IPO'd last year on the big boards were cash flow positive. That's the lowest I think it's ever been, but in a long time. The new world is not going to be okay with that. They're going to want assets. They're going to want cash flow, and cannabis can do that with its demand. So you have to be excited about where we were going into this. Then where are we now? Well, I don't know another industry can say that they had all that going for them in, at least in the emerging sector category. And then during, we essentially don't lose many lines of our revenue. There have been places that were slower to adopt, some were slower to do curbside or delivery, but at the end of the day, we still have just about most of our lines of revenue that accounted for that tremendous growth. If you look at, just pick an industry uh, that is recession proof, the pandemic is a different thing. Recession proof and pandemic proof are totally different what we're finding, right? So if you're alcohol, who's always thought of being recession proof. Well, you just lost about 80% of your lines of revenue because there are no restaurants and planes and boats and concerts and events. So uh, yes, you can deliver. Yes, you can pick up, but you lost a lot of that. The way the rules are written in cannabis and hemp today, you can't do that. They aren't available in any of those commercial public places. So, you know, we're, we were doing great going in. We are, basically doing as good as anybody during. And then what happens after? Well, we compare it to industries like esports or Zoom conference. We're all on Zoom now. We're enjoying these types of meetings. But when this is over or when the new normal sets in, there is going to be attrition for whatever happened to these industries that also did well or thrive during a pandemic. But there's other options for people to consume and behave as a consumer. In cannabis, there's not that option. So uh, when the new world is reopened, Matt, David, we're going to want to be together in person. 
We have to. We love each <laughs> other. We work together. We want to be together. Zoom's not going to cut it. So you're going to go back. At least maybe more people use Zoom, but it's not the only option anymore. But in our industry, you still have the exact same option to be a consumer before, during, and after in terms of purchasing. So what we're seeing happen is consumer behavior patterns are changing, but they're changing and developing in cannabis. People are buying more product than ever before in many cases. And then within that purchase, you're seeing basket sizes bigger than normal. And then when you unpack that, mm -hmm. you're seeing things from a demographic standpoint that have never happened before. You're having some demographic of a individual buying items that we never see them buy. You know, maybe, maybe a, an elderly senior citizen is buying flour and night, night tincture and some cream and something for his pets and something for his wife and kids. And, you know, it's this really diverse bucket that is not normal for consumer behavior patterns. So what that tells us is that during this whole thing, you're starting to see people try new healthy alternatives to things they didn't have before. And I believe that that's going to be a consumer behavior pattern that's going to stay with them forever. And maybe they like some things more than others, but you're seeing a lot of experimenting and, and openness to consumers uh, right now in cannabis. So we are really excited to see where this goes afterwards. But uh, from a regulatory standpoint, you know, from an, an, a, a diligence and analysis standpoint, I don't know that there's another industry that has as much to be excited about as we do, quite frankly. Well, we can feel your excitement coming right through this Zoom. I'll tell you what, it, uh, it does make me nostalgic about being in person. This is exactly the, the kind of networking <laughs> that, is, uh, that I really miss. Absolutely. And, and Matt, one of the things that you're saying, this change in consumer behavior, I think you're absolutely right. With the prospect of having to be sheltered in place, for longer and longer periods of time, people were buying more product than they had in the past, but also experimenting with new uh, types of products that they might not have. But what was also exciting for me to hear was, for example, before the shelter in place orders, when Colorado's governor tried to not deem cannabis as essential, the public uprising was so fervent that within hours they had to reverse the decision and what that tells me is that cannabis consumption is both becoming widely accepted and even access being demanded and with more and more medical proof coming out of the different ways in which cannabis can help people medically and not just from a recreational perspective. I think you're going to start to see a wider acceptance of that from people that would have never even considered trying cannabis prior to this because it's gaining so much social acceptance. You can barely turn on a sitcom these days, although they're not seeming to run too many new episodes these <laughs> days, uh, without a, a comical but positive reference to cannabis as opposed to, uh, you know, five years ago where the only references really were quite negative. Um, but I think it's a change in public perception that's also being echoed in the buying habits of the consumers. And that's what you're so excited about. And we are too. Yeah. And I think that uh, public perception is also really uh, enabling the industry to get new participants, not just on the consumer side, but actually in the industry itself, we're seeing many people from professional and corporate backgrounds getting into this business in a serious way uh, because they, they are looking at what this industry is going to be in the future, five, 10 years from now. And they are really looking to be a part of where the industry is going and actually help it get there. Yeah, I think that's right. Um... It, the industry has been phenomenal from a grassroots campaign standpoint over the years. Uh, I think all of us that are in this and um, share a similar mentality, which is this is good for people. People like it. And as much as um, we've built product differentiation today, we've only begun to scratch the surface. One of the reasons I love AgriFi, and there's many, is because you guys have the most efficient way to control an environment with which to grow these plants. And they're extremely complex, as you know, 400 molecules in these things, people say, I don't think we know exactly, but um, maybe 80 active compounds. David says and even more. Being able to, 
Maybe even more, David. Yeah, the, uh, but the, the, the reality is Israel is topping out at 503 different chemical metabolites. Really, how crazy. fun is that? How fun is this? So we haven't even begun yet. Okay, so in in reality, the number is five to seven percent of adult population in the world is a fairly active cannabis user already, and they that's been around for tens of thousands of years. So here we are. It, 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 you know, with five to seven percent of the world's population, a hundred percent of the world's adult population has probably been able to access cannabis flower if they've wanted, but that wasn't going to change. We have to figure out how do we build product for the other 93 to 95 percent of the world. Okay, so what I like about Agrify is, yes, you can help create some of the best flower known to man and do it consistently in a controlled environment, but you can also do R&D. You know, I love the fact that, um, you know, it reminds me a little bit of how probably Steve Jobs and Wozniak must have felt when they were in their garage in San Francisco all these years ago, right? And trying to build Apple and they understood technology, computer technology. David understands science and molecular technology very well. To me, as somebody who knows a little bit about both, they're very similar other than we're on a computer right now and all the things that go into that is a type of technology. We're also a human being and internal. We are a different type of technology, a, 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 a molecular technology, a, you know, a, a constantly trying to achieve homeostasis technology. And how can we take this plant, which is so natural, as we all know, the endocannabinoid system, and take an environment, you know, again, like an agrifier, where you can have the highest quality consistent plant and be able to start understanding and deconstructing and reconstructing and creating products for these, you know, if you had a room of a hundred people, you'd say, okay, five to seven of you, why don't you step out? We're going to continue to great, make great flour for you. And we're going to make that legal, efficient and put a brand on it. And you don't have to go to the black market anymore. That's great. And that's wonderful about this industry because you get a double-sided growth curve. People forget we're growing 36% right. in revenue every year, but we also are taking smaller and smaller and larger and larger pieces from the black market. So that's rare. Mm -hmm. But the reality is what we're seeing is the other 95% of the world discover the properties of this plant, whether that be in a cream or a tincture or something for, I'm losing hair like crazy. And I've got this stuff I put on my hair now and it's working. And you know, our bodies are phenomenal, but it's our job just like it was for the Apple guys to go into this plant, these 400 to 508 properties and say, how can we get this to the human population, put a brand on it so that they can identify that experience and create something that's either better than what they had before, but in cannabis's case, what's really exciting is that you're creating product categories that don't even exist on the shelf today. So you well, know, it's I, sort I of like, they didn't, they, they didn't know the Apple iPhone was coming. <clears throat> People didn't know that the Mac was coming, but they knew computer technology was there. So people are starting to discover these new products. They're discovering how great this plant can be for the body. It's now our job to be able to continue to deliver quality product, branded product, but quality product to them that can benefit their lives. And that's what we're seeing happen right now. It's just exciting. It really, really is. Well, I, I really like what you had to say there because I think you hit on some really excellent points, uh, namely, that the population of consumers is so small right now compared to what it can be. And also that analogy back to the early days of Apple computer, where Steve Jobs really, I think, identified something that was particularly novel back then, which was that the people that they were selling to computers to weren't the people that they were going to sell computers to in the future. <laughs> yeah, and that right. they needed to make a computer for everyone else. And, you know, consistency is part of that, right? Because, you know, as a enthusiast or a consumer of cannabis, if you want to sort of bring that trusted person in your life and have them experience what you like, you want to know that that experience is going to work out. And you want that consistency so that you know the thing that you've seen before is going to, to deliver that same experience for that trusted person. And, and having that, that uh, confidence that uh, the experience is going to be consistent, much like whether you go to Starbucks or McDonald's or any of the other brands you could think of, consumer 
experience needs to be consistent to make it truly ubiquitous. Absolutely, Matt. And when you're talking about the consistency of the experience and Matt Norgren, you're talking about the consistency of the chemical profiles. I think that you have to understand that there are so inextricably linked with the 500 plus chemical metabolites it's the actual different proportion that the plants are producing those metabolites and the ratio of one metabolite to another that has a holistic effect of all of the different metabolites produced hundreds and hundreds of them that give cannabis or each cannabis strain its unique effect. And I think as more and more people start to explore cannabis, they'll find more of these varieties that are effective for them and that are effective at treating certain conditions or delivering certain uh, effects. And it's that level of confidence once you can start delivering the desired effect at a consistent level, <laughs> right. which is what the AgriFi technology is all about, is, is minimizing those chemical variations to ensure that not only is the highest quality flower produced, but as consistent as it can be grown to minimize the yeah. adverse reactions or the inconsistent impact of those chemical profiles. Yeah, and that's the name of, to me, a brand exists basically for a consumer to identify a consistent experience. That, that's what a brand is to me. Yeah. And, you know, um, and I think to many people, right? But you can't have a Coca-Cola in LA and it be a different experience in New York. It won't work. Um, and so uh, the industry is really close to getting that figured out, but obviously some regulatory things will help there. Um, but you have to have a consistent experience. And so uh, what's interesting about where we are now and all these new product categories and you know, um, you guys know this as well as anybody, but um, we work with you guys a lot. We work with a lot of people that work with you and being able to be first to market is phenomenal. You could be Kleenex. Don't even call it a tissue. You just call it a Kleenex. That's great. There are countless inventions with these cannabinoids that come through our inbox on a daily basis that we scratch our head and say, oh my God, I didn't even know you could do that with these things, with these plants. It's unbelievable. If you're out there watching this right now and you haven't spent a lot of time on this, for example, on the hemp side, just Google uses of hemp. It'll blow you away. It'll absolutely blow <laughs> you away. And so, you know, when you have 508 molecules, David, how many of these are extremely active molecules? Do we know yet? Not fully, but they're, they're, of the 503, there's probably only a handful that are in active amounts that people are looking at as chemically active for psychoactive properties. But it's that entourage effect, the interrelation of all of them that really deliver the full efficacy to a consumer or patient. Um, so what's interesting is... Oh, I'm sorry, Matt, but I was just going to say, whereas a lot of focus currently has been on THC and CBD uh, with some level of interest now starting in CBG, I think that you're going to see that these more minor metabolites are going to start to play a bigger and bigger role in the future product creation because it's the metabolites that we have less experience with and less yeah. time scientifically experimenting with. So right. it's just a Pandora's box, a, a plethora of uh, different chemical compounds for future research in all different avenues from anti-inflammation to anxiety that are really going to deliver a, a new and, and panacea David, of medicine. And David, we've seen that with some of the consumer buying habits. Uh, you know, I noticed that in Nevada where they require actually disclosure of not just those uh, things like CBD and THC, but also uh, the terpene profile that consumers are adjusting their buying patterns because they've got more information to help correlate the experience that they're having with the product to what the chemical profile looks like. And because they have that more information, they're starting to realize that, you know, just those few chemicals isn't the whole answer. It's really this larger profile of those metabolites that you refer to. And in that fun, we get to de define categories, you know, right now, they aren't even fully defined yet. So a lot of great work to do, but, uh, and David, thanks for explaining that a little bit and, and Matt too, because of these active molecules and the other hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that aren't as active. And then you throw in all the terpene profile possibilities and how those interact. And, you know, we're, I'm a big entourage effect fan. I believe in that, but there's so many categories of product that, 
from a medical standpoint, you're going to have to extract these, prove efficacy with one molecule, and then take it through clinical trial and some delivery method, and then combine it with one other one, and then combine it with this and combine it with that. And there's so many applications, it's endless. It's absolutely endless. And so, you know, it's, it's a really exciting time. I mean, uh, I think people will look back at this moment in history, and uh, I think cannabis and hemp are going to play a very critical role in the way consumers consume a lot of things going forward. Uh, I mean, these products from these two plants, they can be in almost every item in the grocery store, just about every item behind the counter and in front of the counter. They can also be in just about everything in Home Depot, um, textiles, fabrics, concretes. So we have a lot of work to do. And that's what's exciting. But going back to the business essential and these consumer behavior patterns that are happening, you know, what I think the viewers and, and, and you guys and I find fascinating is unpacking every day what is being developed for people. And uh, I think we're just scratching the surface. But what we all know for sure and why we're in this is because people need it in their lives. People want it in their lives. I was a sportsman. I got, you know, a, a jersey here on the back. I was a backup quarterback, didn't play much, but really learned how to support teams and be a good investor through that process. But the point is, sports aren't on TV anymore. You know, you don't see entertainers. And that's not a bad thing. We love athletes. We love in, being entertained. But in a time like this, it's about what do you need? What do you have to have in your life? And what was really fascinating about that is a few weeks ago when the first stimulus checks hit, um, we noticed a massive uptick across the board in purchasing the day that stimulus checks hit. And we saw this for a couple of days and didn't know really where it came from. You know, it was just kind of like we're watching everything happen and all of a sudden one day this happened and it was the stimulus check. We tied it directly to it. A Kerna company we have, um, a, a, you know, an investment in as well, does a good job of unpacking that BDS analytics, some others. And wow, is that interesting. So we're in this because all of you out there that are watching this need this in your life. And we haven't even started to give you all the things that are going to make your life better. So um, it's an interesting time. It's a pivotal time. It's happening around the world. You don't have to sell this. You don't have to sell this. You just need to get it in front of people and you need to get them different products. They don't even know exist. It's going to make their life better. So that's why we're in this. Yes, the economic return is phenomenal. Absolutely. And it's going to be a, a generational wealth creating event for a lot of people. And let me give a little shout out. A lot of our investors, I think, are watching <laughs> right now. So they're keen to hear a little bit more from Matt and David, obviously. But um, that's who we work for. We work for those guys. We're just an extension of our investors. Guys, thank you for joining us. But viewers uh, that are out there tuning in, trying to learn more about this industry, wow, do you have a lot to be excited about because you're in here just like we are. You want a higher quality life. And everywhere we go, and Matt and David and I have been a lot of places, one of the questions I always ask, and I can't see anybody uh, out there, obviously, but let me ask the question anyways. Can anybody out there honestly tell me at this point in time that something from this plant hasn't made someone's life, if not your own, significantly better? I think you might have a hard time right now finding almost anybody that doesn't know somebody that, life, that their life is better. What else do we have to do with our time if it's not putting it towards something that makes other people's life better? So we can, couldn't be more encouraged. Daily calls, daily stories all over the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My child doesn't have to have a brain surgery now because of a plant. Great. Thank you. My knees aren't hurting. Thank you. I can sleep. Okay, this isn't sports. Okay, LeBron James is amazing. Uh, you know, I don't know who else. Blake Shelton's amazing. Entertainers <laughs> are amazing. Certain industries are amazing. But this industry isn't just amazing. It's needed. It's a necessity. And people are demanding it. And it's not even anything other than this far along yet. So we're going to keep creating product for people. We're going to make people's lives better. We're going to make a lot of people a lot of money along the way. But more importantly, we're going to make people's lives better. And that's what we're in this for. And gosh, I know you guys are excited. 
Um, sorry for getting carried away, but uh, no, it's just, it, it's it's okay. I mean, it's it's great to be passionate about the industry, uh, and we need more people in the industry that are are passionate about building it. Really, at the end of the day, and you know, we're trying to do our part in our little corner of the world. Um, you know, we, we've got our own economic stimulus out there for customers, helping them with finance to get them building more cultivation facilities. You know, we're trying to do our part. And I know a lot of your portfolio companies are doing their part to build this industry and move it forward. Yeah, we're supporting each other. That's the wonderful thing about this industry that I've never experienced in any other. You guys have been in a lot of industries as well. And have you ever seen another one that people come together like this? I mean, it, it's almost like you know, the plant has this sort of work together mentality anyways, this entourage effect. Um, can't help but to think about the fact that, you know, because it works so well with us, if you go back millions of years, how intertwined are we? Okay, so, uh, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's just encouraging being able to work with everybody here. And, and the growth is phenomenal. I know we're here to talk a lot about growth. And want to get into that a little bit as well. What we're seeing in the market is really interesting. Um, but I think growth is a mindset. It's a can-do attitude. Uh, certainly, uh, chance favors the prepared mind. And so you need all the data you can get. And I know you guys are data hounds, and a lot of our companies are. But it's the can-do attitude. It's knowing what you are, are setting out to do and getting it done no matter what the cost. I've watched entrepreneurs in this industry go this way and this way and this way. And that's to be expected in an emerging industry. That's why, you know, we got in early, you build companies, that's what's fun. But the growth is, is being prepared for the future, but you don't have to necessarily know what the future is. You just have to believe, you have to believe you're going to do it. And uh, I don't think we could have any more reasons to be compelling as to why we believe the growth is going to continue. 36% compound annual growth numbers, over the last six to seven years is pretty phenomenal. And we haven't even had access to institutional resources. We're just getting resources. started. We haven't had access to institutional resources, but we're this close. Did you know across every public company in cannabis, you're less than 3% institutional support across cap tables? Real institutional allocators, not you know constellation involved with canopy. I mean, institutional allocators. What does that tell you? How in the world does an industry get this big without access to institutional resources? And we're that close to getting them. As soon as that happens, my goodness, can you imagine how much growth is going to be there? So um, I, I can, let's talk fact. about that a little bit. What do you guys think about the <laughs> yeah, uh, upcoming growth? Uh, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we have a very supply driven market right now, namely cultivators grow product and then put it for sale in the market and try and do the best they can. And I think we're going to be moving to a demand driven market where the dispensaries have their fingers on the pulse of what the consumers want and they need their cultivation facilities to support them as opposed to just dumping product and asking them to make it work. <laughs> yeah. I think that's going to be a fundamental shift, honestly. Yeah. Absolutely. And as the stability and consistency of the product increases, you can expect that demand to increase as well because it's very hard when people are still having inconsistent experiences to build that brand loyalty, that product loyalty that would be able to support um, a demand driven yeah. industry. And so until we get to that consistency, I think that we, we're, we're going to see this kind of up and down. But once that consistency becomes ubiquitous across the industry, the industry is going to grow at an entirely different trajectory. Uh, sure is. Consistency and reproducibility allows a business to plan for the future. So many under industries, you know, people can, can think about what tomorrow is going to bring, what next week, next quarter. But many in the cannabis business, you know, they're under siege every day. What's going to happen to me today? I don't know. We're just reacting. And we, we really got to enable these businesses to make plans and proactively uh, address their market opportunity without just firefighting every day. And it's a lot about timing, isn't it, guys? Because, um, <laughs> you know, and by the way, timing, if you go back and look at uh, a lot of 
our most favorite season successful investors in history, they probably are all going to tell you that timing is the number one determinant in a successful investment. I mean, said another way, if you had management and IP and proper capitalization, you had all those other things in a great place and your timing couldn't have been worse, you could literally lose and have everything else right. And so it's this constant, you know, game of trying to grow, but not outpace yourself. And I think the industry did that a little bit early on in terms of valuations and structures. But the good news, I think, for us is through 2019, we already had valuation correction. And so going into the pandemic, that had already been done. So with 36% growth, you offset a lot of that. But, you know, what's interesting from the timing perspective is, let's go back to the Steve Jobs analogy. You couldn't have created Apple 10 years earlier. It wasn't, the technology wasn't there. And, and David, I know you'll be uh, probably more um, excited to talk about this topic than anybody, but we haven't had the resources to explore these molecules no. the right way in these plants until just now. And they still really aren't fully there. You know, Dr. Sue Sisley uh, here in the States and a number of other people in Israel, China is doing a lot of work. I mean, you're going to see this happen. But the timing is now, if you ask me, in terms of actually being able to get to market with anticipating certain regulatory things, but at the same time, having the technology from a science standpoint available so that you can actually build it. I think we're kind of in this perfect little middle ground now where, you know, you, you have a really good idea what's to come, but you also have enough science and enough technology to actually build for it. And, you know, so, um, I think that's what's happening right now. And the timing of that couldn't be better if you're thinking about growth. David, what are you seeing in terms of some of the research that's happening that's exciting you? You know, I, I think you're absolutely correct. And in terms of the research, it's, it's really what you're talking about is the serendipitous confluence of politics, social acceptance, scientific abilities, and the overall demand of a consumer culture that's now coming out of what was a black market use scenario and into a legitimate uh, business, a, a way of procuring their cannabis. And so what's happening with the research is as social acceptance is growing, as political regulations are changing, more and more universities are able to do proper scientific research, both on the cultivation of the plant, on the chemical metabolites themselves. Some of the most interesting research is definitely still coming out of Israel with Raphael Mecolum and Didri. Uh, in terms of researching the cannabinoids and the specific, uh, specific effects and what cannabinoids can have what impact on the endocannabinoid system. Uh, I think the most exciting research right now, uh, not surprisingly with COVID uh, on the tongues and, and minds of everyone across the globe, is on anti-inflammatory properties of cannabis. Yeah. Several Isn't of the cannabinoids. Crazy? are incredibly uh, efficacious oh. at reducing inflammation, inflammation. but we're, we're at just the beginning of yeah. learning about these compounds. So what's yeah. exciting to me is that social acceptance is changing political values. Political values change. That allows research universities to actually do proper scientific research, not on the harms of cannabis, which is how it's been for the last 80 years, but on the actual benefits. And then with molecular science coming into play and us being able to isolate specific chemical compounds from the plant and even produce those compounds synthetically, we're able to start doing proper scientific research and seeing what the efficacies are of these lesser known metabolites. And so, uh, sorry for rambling, but it is exciting. It is the future of medicine. People have been searching the rainforest for a random plant or bug that they might not have encountered that could hold the key to some new medicine. And here we all are sitting on a plant that can produce food, concrete, fibers, medicines, recreational compounds as well. But what's really exciting is that the, we are in that infancy, as you explained, and that the, the future is very open to us. And it's, it's now is the time to become involved and to, to help shape that future because it, the research is just so much uh, at the beginning and there's so much more to do. Yeah. Uh, so very excited to see where the future of all of this goes.
when when I think about uh, a lot of our customers, uh, you know, they're very attuned to what the future looks like in this industry. Now, obviously, nobody has a crystal ball; they can't tell it perfect, but they have a really good idea of where they think the industry is going, and they see themselves participating and helping the industry get there. And you know, these industry builders they recognize that all of this science, this research that you guys are referring to, is still coming. And there's going to be a really exciting things to come. And then the question is, how do you apply that back in your organization once it does come out? Right. You know, are you going to have to forklift upgrade your entire cultivation facility because we learned something from the science and now you have to basically throw everything out and start over? Do you have a set of uh, technologies and infrastructure that allows you to adopt new ways of growing new recipes that we learned from all this research and apply it immediately? Those are going to be key differences for, for people who are thinking ahead and for others who are just responding to the here and now. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Matt. Um, selfishly, I have to ask you a question because we do have a number of our investors here. Can you talk a little bit about AgriFi? Uh, and I don't know if this is normally what you do on these, but um, just for our benefit in terms of what AgriFi is doing to help that in terms of R&D for grow facilities in terms of efficacy for grow facilities in terms of, you know, developing new products. How, how, uh, if you don't mind sharing just a little bit about that, that would be great for some of uh, the people we had listening today. Well, I, I think most people recognize the advantage of precision growing, but what we've really done is we've elevated precision growing to pun intended uh, another level. And mm -hmm. the way we do that is by having a microclimate where you can optimize your growing recipe in a very small space. That allows you to do a number of things. Uh, one, it allows you to have consistent reproducible outcomes um, from that small space, but it also allows you to do subtle experiments to help with that optimization. And it allows you to have very specific recipes by genetic. And so much like a facility might have, let's say 10 different rooms with slightly different uh, setups with our system, you can have literally hundreds. Yeah. And so that granularity really allows you to get to a level of reproducibility or fidelity that is unparalleled in the industry. But we also accept that, you know, not only do we need to provide this technology to make things reproducible, but it needs to be scalable and needs to be deployable in a systematic and cost effective manner. And so one of the things we identified that the industry was really lacking was good use of three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. There's tons of systems out there that go vertical. And we've had a number of episodes where we've talked about some of the aspects of going vertical and our system being stackable and incorporating uh, the catwalk system that allows you to, to take a large open plan warehouse and have hundreds of individual climate uh, controlled areas without having to build floors, use scissor lifts, ladders, or all the other inefficient technologies that I'm sure you've seen really just elevates this precision to a whole new level. Thank you, Matt. I, I know some guys wanted to hear that and gals <laughs> on the phone. So, um, and by the way, if you're on here from uh, Arcadian side, uh, you know, definitely reach out to Matt and David and we can help connect you because AgriFi is doing some amazing things. And uh, we think that the way the future is going in terms of efficacy and efficiency and consistency and R&D, you know, AgriFi is really set up in a special way to help solve a lot of that. So if you're on here from our side, uh, uh, obviously you're all partners in AgriFi, uh, please reach out to them. They've, they've got some really good things going. Well, we really appreciate that. David, would you like to add anything to that? You know, just in terms of what AgriFi's technology really allows and fosters is that with so many different chemical compounds, as we've been discussing throughout this episode, the ability to manipulate the environment to both stabilize the production of those compounds, but also enhance the production. I'll give an example. There are several cannabis strains that produce a purple color on the leaves and the flowers, and whether it's aesthetically attractive to consumers, is that the one behind you, David? Demand. 
Sorry, say again. Is that the one behind you in your screen? It looks like. Oh, it's a little actually, purple. yes. The strain behind <laughs> me is called A Dub, and it produces some wonderful colors of purples and yellows. Yeah. Uh, the yellows are produced by a, a metabolite called xanthophils, and and the purples are anthocyan. And what's interesting is you can actually increase the production of a chemical compound like anthocyan through different manipulation of the cultivation environment. Now, anthocyan is showing up in a lot of your nutraceuticals right now, mm -hmm. uh, your phyto nutraceuticals, your plant-based uh, vitamins and, and products. And it's listed in a lot of them as an antioxidant. But in cannabis, it's just considered an attractive coloration to the plant. But as more research is coming out, we will be able to use AgriFi technology to enhance the color of a plant through temperature manipulation, wow. light intensity and spectrum manipulation. And then with all of the data collection, the recording of how you got to this optimized result, and then the ability to reproduce it. That's the key. So yeah. as Matt was pointing out, uh, there you have hundreds of essentially experiment chambers at your disposal that are recording data that are allowing you to grow high quality cannabis, but also to maximize the quality one crop over another and right. track all of those changes. So right. it's, it's a very exciting time. And Matt, you, you had uh, mentioned high fidelity control over the environment, which is really key because a lot of traditional cultivation scenarios where you have uh, high pressure sodium lights or double ended uh, HID lights, you don't have the ability to really control the environment. You produce a lot of pockets of variance from light intensity and temperature. Right. And it's the technology that AgriFi provides that minimizes all of that environmental variation and leads to that consistency, but also the ability to optimize. And so that's that's what we're excited about. And, and next week, actually, on AgriFi Live, we have one of the foremost scientists on closed environmental agriculture in the world joining us oh, to great. talk about just that, uh, the ability to granularly control environments and actually manipulate them to a desired end. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Phenomenal. We've we've uh, leveraged some of the the great research that people are doing, and you know after they've figured it out, you know we just plug it into our software, and then we can reproduce it. It's it's a bit like what happened with uh, my uh, my Tesla. Uh, one day I got a software update, and suddenly it was faster and had longer range. Uh, <laughs> nothing in the hardware changed. They just, I guess, through some research, figured out that changing some parameters allowed it to go faster and longer range. And, and so <laughs> that's when, what you're uh, doing, tinkering with it. Yeah. Right. Right. And so when somebody finds out uh, in the research about something to do with maybe light intensity, uh, <clears throat> spectrum, uh, you know, temperatures, whatever the, the combinations that they figure out, we can just plug that recipe into our software and start using that immediately. And, and that's just not something that most people have today unless they're an AgriFi customer. Yeah. Appreciate that I mean, guys. I, uh, you know, couldn't agree more with all that. I hope uh, some of our friends are, 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 are interested in some of these things you're talking about, but uh, you know, one thing that jumps out to me that uh, is really interesting for the consumer is being able to have product that reacts with the consumer the way they want to consume it. And a lot of what people think about products from the cannabis plant are flower vape, um, some type of edible. Well, people, uh, not everyone likes the way the edibles have worked for them over the years, right? I mean, they don't necessarily want to have a bite of something, feel it an hour and a half later, and then be waiting two hours. Some people do. But what you have to have happen is a consumer-friendly product. If people want to go to a bar and be with their friends for three hours, four hours, watch a game, they like to have maybe four or five beers. Um, and you want it to feel it sooner. And then you want it to go away because you have to drive or hopefully you don't drive, but if you're <laughs> at the legal limit, maybe you do, but you have it go away so you can. A lot of the sensitivity around these products is just not having the consistent effect of it. But now you're starting to see products like in beverage, you can accelerate the sensation, right? The quick, uh, a much quicker, uh, bioavailability. Uh, bioavailability. And then 
so from the onset standpoint, you got five to 12 minutes in some of these products now, which is phenomenal. You had to have that technology as well. And then you have to have quicker offset time. Yep. So similar to a beer, you know, if you're, uh, if you drink beer, um, you may not just have one, you're going to have a couple probably if you're in the beer mentality, if you know, you're finishing off your day with a whiskey and I hate using alcohol as an analogy for cannabis, by the way, but for now, we're just going to use it because iterate the point, but you, you haven't had products that work for people with the way they like to consume. Now you do. You can have Matt, a drink. I'm so with happy you're today. talking about the, the right? efficacy of the oh. products because you're really talking about the changes that the pharmaceutical industry has been looking to make. Basically, time release, right? We yeah. can have medicine like Tylenol that delivers its effect over a longer period of time. Or like you're saying for cannabis, something that's more of a faster onset and a faster decrease so that people can control their level of, shall I say, sobriety in order to operate a motor vehicle safely. But I think that there's also a huge topic to talk about with COVID now changing. You know, I, I hear some people kind of questioning whether the typical flour combustion is the right way of consuming. And in mature markets, we've seen flour hold 50 plus percent of market share. But people have to know, like you said, there's other options. There's more than just edibles and flour and drinks. There are inhalers, there are topicals, there are creams, there are salves. Uh, there are so many different methodologies now which can be chosen by consumers that are maybe health conscientious, that are maybe uh, worried about the timing, the amount of time they can allocate to this experience. And so, you know, again, it goes back to the nascency of the industry that we're just starting to get these different delivery vehicles, right. barely touching the surface, scratching the surface of this. And that's what's and great the, about Agrify. You can have a better consistent experience to create those products because you can't miss, good. you cannot, you, you cannot have a brand whatsoever without consistency. That's what a brand does. That's why a brand exists, to put a name on a product that you're going to use every day that you know does what it says it does. And so being able to control that from beginning to end allows you to give the consumer that experience on a precision basis. But you can't start and have it all mixed up. It's complex. It's a very complex plant. You can't miss even the smallest margin because then it throws off the experience and the brand is useless. So you have to control it from beginning to end if you have any chance to be able to have a good business. You have to right yeah. now. Clear, clearly, consistency is super important to brands. But as we look at the medical applications, it's essential. Oh, I mean, look essential. at, uh, you know, GW Pharma, which was the first to, to bring an FDA-approved CBD-based medicine uh, to the market to, to help with um, specific forms of epilepsy. You know, they struggle still to get the consistency out of their plants and their cultivation facility that they need to drive their pharmaceutical uh, process. And, you know, we see some amazing things that people do in the processing side, but all of that is, is made much easier uh, when the cultivation itself is consistent. And so whether someone is taking flour or they're processing it into something else, whether it's for, you know, recreational purposes or for medicinal purposes, consistency is going to be everything for this industry going forward. It definitely is. Well, guys, we have about five minutes left. I'm just so happy to be able to uh, participate with you guys today. Going to be tuning into them every Thursday now. I think you do them every Thursday. That's um, right. That's right. What, what can we uh, shed some light on here in the last five minutes from a, you know, growth equity investment firm standpoint? Well, you mentioned you had about 35 investments um, and, you know, we've talked about a number of things that we see in the industry. Is there some sort of like common thread that you see in the, in the kind of uh, businesses that get you excited, either, you know, the entrepreneurs involved, how they're looking at the industry, just any kind of common thread that sort of weaves it all together? Yeah, that's a great question, Matt. And, and one of the toughest things to do when you're investing in a business and you get past the data, you get past the strategy and you run your analysis and people on our team like Christian Barrier and others are doing tre tremendous work to, you know, put everything on paper that makes sense. 
but then you have to be able to look at the executive team in the eye and feel good about it. And, and that's something that you can't really teach. You just learn over a period of time. When you're investing in an emerging industry and growth, you need to be able to look across the table at the people you're doing business with and trust and know that they will do whatever it takes to make it work. We can't predict what's going to happen. We haven't been able to the last five years and we won't the next five. But as long as you look across that table and you feel like these executives, these C-suite people are ready for any challenge, I I've, I've tend to have a lot of success with that feeling. And, and it's, it's not just the data. All those things have to align. The story has to make sense. Everything has to be on paper, of course. But what I found interesting, I think, in the last few months especially, is when times get tough, how do people respond? And fortunately for us, it hasn't been as tough. It's actually been a great benefit for cannabis and hemp, but it's still the world we're living in. And uh, there are going to be things, depending on the business, that are tougher than others. Um, are you going to figure it out? And who's doing that? And a lot of people are failing. A lot of people are succeeding with you know, flying colors. And so we're fortunate in our portfolio to, as we sit here today, to not have any companies that have had a disaster that killed them. Um, so we feel very fortunate to have, you know, had to deal with certain circumstances, small and big fires in different ways. But at the end of the day, uh, there's a group of people that are in there in charge of solving it. And what they have at their disposal is investors that are there with them. As you guys know, we've gone through a number of things together and we've been there the whole way and we're going to support you the whole way. And uh, as great or as bad as things are, we're there with you. If it's a dark alley, I'm taking the gloves off and I'm there with you until the last man standing. And that's what equity investors do. And so for us, we're not going to let any of our companies die. We're going to be in there every second of the way, being an extension of you in the marketplace, hearing and seeing everything that's going on and tying it together. And I think that's what's helped our companies be successful. But I think the main thing to point out right now, and there's a million other factors and timing and management and capitalization and all these the IP. But what you find out right now is you are not going to have a business in an emerging industry, not have challenges. You're going to have to pivot. You're going to have to solve. Who's going to do that? You, are you going to be a deer in headlights or are you going to figure it out? And um, we've been fortunate to have that. And I think that's probably one of the most interesting things from our perspective that ma many folks in the industry don't see just the seat we sit on in terms of, you know, being able to work with so many great companies is just how <laughs> resilient uh, and battle-tested people like Matt and David on this call, but other great entrepreneurs in this industry are. I'd say the other thing that's really interesting uh, to me as well is how much people collaborate. And I haven't seen this uh, collaboration throughout an entire industry before in my lifetime. And it's only become more so through the last few months than it was before, and we were already good. I mean, this is an industry that cares about women. This is an industry that cares about ESG principles. This is an industry that cares about minorities in the environment. So you had all these amazing things working and now all of a sudden things get even more difficult and everybody bands together. And so, you know, uh, it's, it's really, really encouraging from that standpoint. Those are some of the things that I've never seen before at this, at this level. You start to see people fight and kill each other and this is mine, this is mine, I got this market share, no room for you. But we all know how big this is. And to see everybody support each other, it's emotional. It really is. It's an emotional roller coaster in a positive way because of the outpouring of support, even the funds. I mean, there's probably, you guys know most of the funds, there's probably 10, 15 really great funds out there. Uh, humbly, I think people would put us in that category, but we work together. We're not fighting for deals. We want to all be in deals together. We want to work together. We want to support companies. Companies want to work together. Um, so I think that's one of the most encouraging things that we're seeing right now, how battle tested uh, these entrepreneurs are like you guys. And just being able, Matt, to look you in the eye at dinner and lunch like we have and David and know you're going to get it done. And you know that Arcadian, 
and these other funds out there that are great equity funds are going to be there with you every step of the way until we get there. So that really steps, uh, you know, sets itself apart in my mind in terms of the industry. And um, I think you guys would agree the best is yet to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, those were, uh, you know, passionate and strong words. And, you know, one of the great things about having investors like you is that we can make that same commitment to our customers and tell them that, you know, there's going to be some unknown things in the future and we're going to be right there with them. And we can make that commitment to them because you guys are committed to us so that we can all succeed. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you, when you said resiliency, that's a, a key word that everybody needs to have out there. We want our customers to be resilient. We want to be resilient. And, you know, we really uh, uh, adore the, the support that you provide us to do that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I, I couldn't be happier. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. God bless you. Thank All you. right. Well, hey, this was another great conversation. I feel like, you know, we blow through an hour and there's still so much more to say. <laughs> Um, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll catch up, uh, uh, another time and hopefully it's a uh, in person and we've got this uh, social distancing behind us in, in the near future. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and David, thanks again for uh, co-hosting with me and, uh, we'll see everybody next week, which I think will be really exciting. If you like hearing about what the future is on the research side, you're going to get to hear it firsthand. And I think everybody's going to be really excited to see what's happening uh, in the research world. Thanks again. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.